Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm talking to Tyler Berger. Uh, he has a podcast called Lifting the Iceberg and today he's interviewing me for the podcast. Yeah, so Lifting the Iceberg, it's a psychology podcast that uses art as a window to the mind. And I think Carolina is a brilliant visionary artist and we're talking about one of her latest pieces uh, titled The Evolution of Plants. So I'm interested in ex exploring what inspired you to make this piece? What is so inspiring to you about the plant world? And what did your process in creating this piece teach you about yourself and the universe? Sounds great. Yeah, so Lifting the Iceberg, it's a wide-ranging psychology podcast where mm -hmm. I talk to mostly artists, but I've also talked to uh, media theorists, parkour athletes, mm -hmm. and anyone who has an interesting idea on what it means to live a creative life what it means to live the human experience, you know? And that's a broad theme. Mm -hmm. So the way I anchor it is by talking about one particular subject, right. one particular iceberg that yes. we then lift. Hashtag lifting the iceberg. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so sounds good. So let's get into it. I'm yeah. really excited to explore this piece yeah, with you. Yeah, me too. Carolina Alevado, I'm super excited to talk with you about this piece, The Evolution of Plants. Yes, thank um, you for having me, I'm excited. Yeah, of course. Uh, so my first question, like let's just get into the initial broad question of what inspired you to make this? What's this piece all about? Oh man, <laughs> yeah. um, this is actually one of the first pieces that I do as an actual study of how our world works. In 2014, in 2015, I started a project called Organisms. Mm -hmm. And this was my first project in the one I was doing studies of seven different organisms from planet Earth. So I started with something as little as seashells, and I did a 50 by 40 painting out of the seashell world mm -hmm. and the geometric shapes it has. And I picked up other six organisms, and one of them were plants. Mm -hmm. So when I did the plant painting... I didn't do a study as broad as this one. I was more than anything just studying their shapes and leaves. And I actually did three little paintings of three Peruvian plants. Um, and that was my first encounter with a plant world in my mm. art. And then I just kept being fascinated by how our planet works. I feel that's what really inspires me and mm -hmm. helps me wake up in a happy mood every day i feel our our world is just magical it's very intelligent there's a lot of information i don't understand what we're doing flying on a rock in space and i don't understand how this rock in space has a lot of little seeds that mm -hmm. carry all the information that we need for everything to work in symbiosis um so with this painting i have a very bad memory so if i watch a documentary I learn, but after a week, I'll forget everything that I listen to. If I read a book, I f I'm very forgetful of most things that I read or see. So I realized that in this case, I really wanted to understand how the plants evolved, how they started being just protist and green algae inside the sea and how mm -hmm. throughout the time they became trees with fruits and flowers and they just built the whole plant kingdom mm -hmm. that we have in our planet now um so with this painting i really wanted to do a very uh delicate study of how the whole evolution of plants went from green algae to trees and that's how this painting started amazing yeah um and i love the mandala structure that permeates so much of your work it's a great way of laying out exactly what's going on in this piece because you this mandala it represents the span of time mm -hmm. from the center to what's going on on the outside the more evolved plants what exactly is in the center of this mandala so before having green algae inside the water the first organisms that existed were called protistas or mm -hmm. protists and there's a bunch of different representations for them. And in this case, I didn't want to represent protest as how they really look. I wanted to use one of my symbols, 
the symbols that I use in my work, which is usually just a little circular thing that looks maybe like a planet, but it can also be a tiny atom. Mm. So what we have in the center is something that you could say it's either a planet or an atom or just like a little cell. And I really wanted to represent that uh, more mystic part of we don't really know how life started and mm -hmm. we don't really know there's so many theories about how the world be came to be and how our solar system appeared but we are not a hundred percent sure mm -hmm. so i really wanted to keep in the center something to be a little bit more um open to question about yeah. what we have in the center and then i did a couple um what i call orbits in my mandalic work um with just a bunch of repetition, which for me symbolizes a lot of how repetition brings me into a meditative and, um, yeah, meditative state mm -hmm. and how it can be, uh, you know, like optical illusion. It brings you into these illusions. So it's pretty much an invitation for the observer to realize how, even though this is scientific and biological, um, there's so much magic and so much illusion in our world mm -hmm. so the first few um orbits of this painting are are an invitation of that illusion illusion or more magical playful part of our planet mm. very cool yeah mm -hmm. carl jung always said that um in the middle of the mandala lies uh at least his concept of the true self the mm -hmm. self that stays constant through all transformations and everything else in the mandala is a radiation outwards from that most fundamental essence and i love how you kind of really nail that archetype mm -hmm. and i love how you kind of kept it a little mysterious and yeah. up for the viewer to kind of project their own understanding onto it because mm -hmm. the most mysterious part of reality is what lies at the center right. of us mm -hmm. you know what is the center of the psyche what is the true self mm -hmm. where does that come from is it localized in our own mind or is it something more collective and yeah. transcendent it's it's very interesting that you mention young because i as soon as I finished high school i went to college for management for a year mm -hmm. because i was you know very afraid of doing artwork. I felt I really didn't have anything to say, but I felt very drawn to it as well. So I, after a year in management, I switched careers and I went to printmaking. And that's when my art journey in college started. And at first I didn't do any of the work that I'm known for now and the type of work that I do now, mm -hmm. which I feel is the work that my truer self wants to do. Yeah. Um, but this work came to me when I was already in school for about two or three years. I went, my family's from the jungle in Peru. So me and my sister were visiting my father there and we went to a Temascal ceremony. And I remember that in that ceremony, I was asking, um, I was asking the elders and source and just, you know, the magic of the world mm -hmm. if it could show me my medicine. And when I went back home uh, in Lima, which is in the coast in Peru, I, for the first time, started spending time with myself. And I started creating this mandalic looking artwork. And it was full of dots and eyes. And at first, I didn't really know what this meant. And in art school, especially the art school that I went to, you need to have a objective on what you're doing and you need to be able to explain why you're doing the mm. things that you're doing and at this point in life i really didn't know where these mandalas were coming from i didn't know what they meant i just knew that they were like dripping out of me they and were i just appearing in yes, your imagination i really needed to you know expel them and bring them out and that's when i read a piece by Jung because he also painted mandalas mm -hmm. and he writes that he didn't know where these mandalas were coming from and he, they were just dripping out of him as they were doing for me and that after a time he was able to give them an explanation that was related to the psyche and to a thera therapeutic um, 
a therapeutic method for himself. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that I brought to my teachers being an art student. And I was like, this is what's happening to me. And Jung will be my kind of the person that I can quote mm -hmm. and have Has to explain permission. why you're doing exactly. This. So yeah. his writings gave me permission to be able to do this mm -hmm. in art school and not just keep it a secret in my notebooks. Mm -hmm. And after a time, I've been able to give this mandalas a meaning. And now all these little dots and eyes that started expelling out of me and that I keep doing even in my plant mm -hmm. work. For me, that's my way of representing source or energy or love or this thing that is flowing through every living organism. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was mentioning that the first few layers or the first few orbits of this mandala are full of little do dots mm -hmm. and eyes inviting uh, the observer to realize that everything in the plant world is alive and it's looking and it's having a, its own experience. I feel mm -hmm. that's why the eye is always present because I feel that every living organism is having their own experience of mm -hmm. life and they are not just around our human experience that sometimes, you know, we feel like humans know it all and we are the center of it. Anthropocentrism. So yeah. yeah. So it's great to see um, and to remember that these these organisms are as alive as we are and they mm -hmm. have a very different intelligence that we do, but they are very intelligent as well. Yeah. One yeah. of my favorite quotes of all time is from Terence McKenna, where mm -hmm. he says, animals are just something plants invented to spread seeds around. Yeah, definitely. You know, like the plants are really the ones running things. And I love this uh the symbol that you use this motif in all of your work of mm. the dots and the eyes to represent this consciousness that seems to permeate all sentient things. But something I've noticed in your work is that you draw the backdrop, this fog of dots and eyes, but you never put an eye onto a plant. You never like draw a plant and make an eye on one of the leaves as if the plant has that eye i do though you do there Where? are a bunch um so there are some little ones here you know there's, oh there's so there's oh here they're here but they're very oh, wow they're so camouflaged yes. oh so you do recognize uh -huh. that i, do I guess them. i was looking for more of like a cartoon eye right like, <laughs> so i they're do so them, subtle but you're right i try to camouflage them so you can only oh yeah now they almost look like little seeds yeah but they're eyes i do camouflage Amazing. them just so i feel like sometimes we're like in the run and we don't really take the time to look mm. um at the little details yeah. of plants or anything around us. So I feel I leave all these tiny little treasures for the observer mm. that is like actually taking the time um, yeah. and look into all the details. Oh like, man, I need to get a microscope. Here. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. They're around, but they're, yeah. they're camouflaged. Um, Very cool. Because I also don't want to throw like everything's alive. I want this mm -hmm. to be like a little secret that people that are observing start like catching. Into. Well, now everyone who listens to this podcast now knows the secret of the secret <laughs> eyes. So they're going to yes. be looking out for it. Amazing. Yeah. And I mean, I want to get back again to the mandala structure because mm -hmm. uh, Carl Jung thought that this was something that was mind from the collective unconscious because mm -hmm. uh when he was studying like eastern mysticism uh he saw that the monks would create these mandalas every single one would be different and the mandala itself wasn't even considered important to the monks because it was a representation of a thing and not the thing itself you know mm -hmm. you never want to confuse the finger pointing at the moon with the moon exactly. as it is said in Taoism mm -hmm. um, but this is a representation of something that exists universally in the human psyche mm -hmm. it is something that many individuals experience through all societies throughout throughout the ages and that is symbolic of the fact that it is not pertinent to just one individual mind but that this comes from the mind you know like exactly. this is how our imagination maps out the idea of ourself mm -hmm. so 
my question is, how has making these mandalic structures, how is it, what has it taught you about yourself and how has it allowed you to kind of map your own psyche mm. and understand your own psyche? So actually, the first, when I started doing this mandalic work that I was telling you about, my first projects didn't include anything that we see with our naked eyes in mm. reality, like this plant uh, evolution painting. At first, I was only doing dots and eyes rhythms around the paper in mm. mandalic shapes. And this was the time, this was my therapy, you know? So uh, at the time I wasn't able to meditate, but my meditation was painting the dots and eyes in mandalic uh, repetitions. And this really was like my medicine at the time. I, I was already living in New York and I didn't get a studio. Uh, at that time I was only able to afford a studio, a shared studio, and I didn't do it because... At that point, I would cry a lot and like expel a lot and really like get to know me and let go of all the things that I felt I was still like holding into that were not serving me anymore. Mm -hmm. So the mandalas have been really my medicine and they really helped me to make therapy and get to know myself as my truer self and let go of fear, let go of things that were not really serving. Mm -hmm. And it's been very interesting for me because at first I was only doing black and white work. And then the gold uh, started appearing in my work. And now I have full colored paintings. And now I feel at first I had to dig into my own mind and like get to know more of how I was feeling and about myself in order to be able to later um, get interested in the outer world. First, mm -hmm. I had to like dive into my inner yeah. world and get to know that area. And within time, I've been able to, oh, now I'm curious about how the outer world works. Mm -hmm. Now I feel I know a little bit more about how uh, my own psyche works. Mm -hmm. I know I don't know it all. Of course, there's so much work to be done and so yeah. much work being done every single day. And these mandalic work still helps me and it's still my therapy. But nowadays it's my therapy to get to know our planet. Mm -hmm. So that's been very interesting to how um, the same mandalic shape really has been my therapist for the inner and now for the outer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I do this work because I would really like... I feel I wasn't as much in love with planet Earth as I've been in the last few years. When I was younger, I was more inside my head doing mm. my own thing. Um, and I feel that falling in love with the world has been one of the blessings mm -hmm. of these past few years. And I just don't understand how I lived before. Yeah. Um, and it seems like, you know, you're mapping the outer world mm -hmm. onto the structure of your inner world. That's right. what the mandala represents. So right. what an amazing way to relate to the outer world mm -hmm. because you're kind of bringing the, you're dissolving the boundaries, you know, yes. this is, this both represents the internal mm -hmm. and the external, you know. Because at the end of the day, we put the barrier in between what is the outer outer and what is the inner when yeah. at the end of the day it's all fluid and there's like no solid line mm -hmm. that divides it you know now one experience that uh often more often than not inevitably leads to that realization is the psychedelic experience the yes. dissolving of boundaries you know mm -hmm. terence mckenna said that psychedelics will dissolve the boundaries between you and your lover you mm -hmm. and your dog even you and your washing machine yes. and uh so how has um have you had any experiences with plant medicines and how has that informed your art Yes, definitely. When I was starting this, uh, when this mandalas appeared to me, I think it was in 2011 or 2010, um, I started doing some marijuana therapy uh, before I've had it a few times recreationally with friends, socially. Was this in Peru? Yes. Mm. And, you know, I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't my jam. And the first time that I had a trip by myself in my space, these were these would go 
together. You know, mm-hmm. I would sit down and paint and smoke marijuana and have this therapy session with myself. And marijuana was my medicine for years. And I think it did the job that it had to do. And now I don't smoke. Um, I feel it's not serving me in the same way that it used to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people don't categorize marijuana as a psychedelic. I do because it's been very therapeutical and it's connected me to what I consider or name consciousness or Mm -hmm. the source. And I believe that it's very mind opening if Mm -hmm. used in the right set and setting. So it's great that nowadays we have all this information about set and setting and Yes, after that, I've had a lot of fungi medicine and I've had a lot of um, plant medicine, not only psychedelics. I've, um, you know, my family is from the jungle in Peru. And since I was very young, uh, ayahuasca ceremonies were offered and they I would be invited. But I felt it wasn't the time for me. Mm. And when I when I had my... Uh, the only ayahuasca ceremony I've had, I felt it was right in the right time mm-hmm. because I already knew more about myself. I was in the right place to do it. So it's so important to listen to your intuition exactly. when it comes to whether or not you should explore a yeah. plant medicine. You know, I Definitely. think that's a, in a way, sometimes I feel like the plant is calling you to yes. take it. You know, yeah. you shouldn't, you shouldn't go to the plant. You shouldn't go to Mother Ayahuasca if you're not invited. Exactly. Um, and some, so I have uh, had my experiences with Ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. I did a 10 day dieta in Peru in 2015 um, with Don Jose in Pucalpa. Mm-hmm. And something that I picked up from my experiences is that I feel like I'm talking to something sentient like right. mother ayahuasca you yes. have that experience now the ultimate unanswerable question i think is are you actually interacting with a spirit that exists or mm-hmm. are is are you just experiencing your imagination in a, in a, in a disembodied way right. and mother ayahuasca is one of just the archetypal representations mm-hmm. that uh come out of the imagination i think that the psychedelic chemicals Mm -hmm. it's a language i think this is how the plant speaks to us i think that uh there's a type of uh chemical called an alimone and an alimone is a type of chemical that one organism produces to affect the growth and reproduction of another organism so like the scent of a flower that attracts a bee would be considered right. an alimone because, and that works for both. It's, it's synergistic because the bee will then, uh, help pollinate the flower. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it's very interesting how a lot of people after plant medicine journeys, they will have a newfound respect for nature. Right. It's almost like, Ayahuasca is something that the plant world invented to mm-hmm. stop the monkeys from destroying the earth. Exactly. It seems like it's, it, it seems like the plant world has constructed this intentionally and that it's speaking through us. So what is your, what is your perspective on this subject? Do plants speak to us through psychedelic chemicals? I think they do. And I think they, they do it through psychedelics and also not only through psychedelics. Mm. I, what you were saying before, I, I truly believe that each plant has a spirit and it has kind of its own intelligence. And, you know, this might sound a little like mystical and new agey or mm-hmm. whatnot, but I don't know if you're familiar with the book, uh, The Cosmic Serpent mm-hmm. by Jeremy, Jeremy Narby. Narby. And it's so interesting how he, when he went down to the Amazon, um, then the locals will tell him, oh, we, you know, ayahuasca is a mixture of chacruna and ayahuasca vine. So it's a mix of two different plants. Mm -hmm. And they knew they had to mix those two plants in order to make, you know, ayahuasca has the DMT on it and Mm -hmm. chacruna we humans make DMT all the time, but we have 
I don't know what the name is. I'm very bad with memory, yeah. as I yeah. told you. But there's something in our body that cancels the DMT. It's called monoamine oxidase. That's yeah. it. Um, so chakruna in, makes our body able to process the DMT and mm -hmm. not cut cut it from our system. And it's just mesmerizing. And they don't grow next to each other. Mm -hmm. They grow very far apart. And the locals knew how to do this because when they were brewing and drinking other plants, those other plants told them they should look for ayahuasca vine and mm -hmm. chacruna and mix them together. So, you know, how was this possible? Plants speaking to people and telling them, a recipe that's mm -hmm. insanely out of, great. Out of 40,000 known plants in the Amazon, exactly. humans somehow managed to find the two that, when mixed together, mm -hmm. produces this experience right. where we can communicate to Mother Ayahuasca. And some people say, oh, maybe it was a lot of trial and fail, but there are so many plants yeah. that it that just really doesn't sound mm -hmm. as the way it went down. And not only is it just the combination of plants, there's a process behind exactly. it too. It's like yeah. sometimes an, an explanation of that is maybe a guinea pig uh, mm -hmm. ate uh, the ayahuasca vine and that someone ate that guinea pig and then tripped as the result of eating the guinea pig because the right. guinea pig had eaten that plant. And then they're all like, oh my God, what was this guinea pig eating? Right. Let's find that. Yeah. And then they found it. But the thing is, the guinea pig is not making a tea. Mm -hmm. The guinea pig is not boiling two plants together for four hours in its stomach. Exactly. Th th that explanation doesn't explain where the process mm -hmm. came from. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a balance because I think that during these experiences, we are being taught something yes. seemingly from outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the word psychedelic, psyche is a Greek word that means uh, mind. Uh -huh. And delic comes from, from a root meaning delios, mm -hmm. meaning to manifest. So it also manifests our own mind. Right. This is why a psychedelic experience can teach you about yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and you have this... Uh, you have this presence, Mother Ayahuasca, that yeah. guides you through that process. So it's both you exploring yourself mm -hmm. and you communicating with something outside of you. And I, I, I really believe that we all come from the same source and mm. we are source playing to be Tyler and playing to be Caro. And we do this because if we just are a huge blob, we wouldn't be able to um, evolve and learn and go through different experiences. I feel we need to break source mm -hmm. into lots of different organisms mm -hmm. so that each of us has a job and then we all work in symbiosis. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about like, is this coming from the intelligence of the plant or from ourselves? At the end of the day, I believe it's both because we are the same thing mm -hmm. and we need the plant to show us something that we might have forgot, but mm -hmm. we also know because we are as old as these spirits. Mm -hmm. um, there's no new physical things being created. We are just the same physical energy mm -hmm. and energy recycling itself and transforming. Mm -hmm. um, and every organism is nature's way of, yes. it, it's all an experiment to figure out how life can unfold in this otherwise dark and cold universe. Exactly. You know, life is trying to find a way mm -hmm. and every single unique organism, it's a, uh, it's a way, it's a, it's an experiment. All right. Um, so I think that, uh, I'm really interested in how every single species can be an experiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've noticed you've talked about like the sacred geometry mm. inside of each plant. Yes. Um, 
and that all of these plans seem to kind of unfold on this sacred architecture that mm-hmm. everything in the universe falls upon, you know, mm-hmm. all these little different experiments, they're kind of running on the same software, the same operating system, even our bodies very unintentionally, like our the length of our finger is mm-hmm. proportional to the length of our hand, which is proportional to the length of our arm. You see mm-hmm. this expressed in Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, right. you know, the sacred geometry of our own bodies, mm-hmm. the same, the golden ratio that the plants are unfolding upon. But mm-hmm. how can we live, how can we live our lives in alignment with this sacred architecture? You know, how do we live in alignment with mm-hmm. the structure of the universe, so mm-hmm. to speak? I feel, you know, we are also animals and we sometimes forget that. And I love that we are already living in balance with it. But I feel our daily decisions are what really make the difference in between if we're living a life in balance with planet Earth or if we're not. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I feel like having a daily practice that includes like tapping into your own however you call it, source, mind, Mm. love, tapping into that, I feel makes us rebalance with our own sacred geometry because breathing is also a sacred geometry. Mm. It's ripples. And And patterns. Exactly. And that also, the energy that we're emanating from outside of our body when we go into a room, it's also sacred geometry. And I feel that Having a time for ourselves to rebalance, recenter, meditate is really important, as mm-hmm. well as being with nature. And mm-hmm. that's why I've been so obsessed with plants for the past few years because, you know, I'm, we're in New York right now and the city, eh, there's not a lot of nature around. Yeah. Now in summer, there is, which is great. Everything's green around us, mm-hmm. but. I really wanted to do this little jungle inside my art studio and in my paintings because I feel I'm more in balance, in balance with the sacred geometry of the world when I'm around nature and Mm -hmm. I observe it and I take time and I breathe what they are breathing because we're just like interchanging energy all the time. And drinking plants. And that's what I was uh, saying a little while ago that Mm -hmm. I, I have so much respect for psychedelic plants. And I also do for plants that are non psychedelic because they are also medicine and they have so many benefits for us. Like if you see my pantry there, Mm -hmm. all of that is like pretty much plants, flowers and powder from roots that that's my medicine shelf. Um, Mm. you know, some of them might help for headaches, for rebalancing the acid in our stomach, Mm. for, I don't know, some of them are aphrodisiac, some of them give us lucid dreams, so they have so much magic, and it's crazy that we've uh, banned them from our daily life, like, you know, psychedelics being Schedule 1 and all of that, but that's changing, so that's great as well. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. what are, uh, what are some of the ways you feel like our society right now is not properly recognizing the plant kingdom. I feel, um, you know, this might sound a little conspiracy theorist, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but we can all grow medicine in our backyards or our windows. um, And that is not profitable. Mm. So if the objective of society is to grow profit, then it wouldn't be smart to let humans grow their own medicine. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's what's been happening for years. And in the past few years, I've seen there's more of a boom of plant medicine, be it psychedelic or not, popping up. And nowadays, like even going to a bar, you see mocktails made with mushrooms, which is a whole other kingdom that is Mm -hmm. just crazy. Mocktails. Oh my God. (laughs) And this mocktails made with like, superfoods and made with a lot of roots and herbs that really can get us in can get us high can Mm -hmm. get us nutrition like they 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 have so much um 
So things are changing and that's mm-hmm. amazing. And also with psychedelic plant kingdom, things are changing in the States. Um, PTSD, people that suffer with PTSD nowadays are able to cure and are able to tap into their own selves in order to cure what's going on mm-hmm. through plant medicine, which is amazing. And I really think that, you know, plant medicine is in pretty much all ancient mm-hmm. uh, cultures around the world. And that's not there gratuitously. It's mm-hmm. there because they've really made a change. Now, uh, all the plant, all the plants in the outer frame of mm-hmm. your piece, mm-hmm. do all these plants, are they historically medicinal plants? No. Mm. So what I did with the evolution of plants is, if you see at the center, we start with a green algae. Mm. And then with the first plants that like pretty much look like moss, liverworts, horn mm. throws, mosses, these plants didn't have a vascular system. So this is more of the biological part of my painting. Um, and after the mosses, the first plants with vascular system appeared. And what that means is that plants are able to grow taller. Mm. And before they were just a blob. They didn't have stems or leaves or were not able to pretty much... Any kind of structure. Exactly. And they didn't have any transportation system. So Mm. when the vascular system appears, they have a way to transport water from roots to the leaves. Mm. And at first... We didn't, they didn't have seeds. I'm talking if I were a plant too. We didn't have seeds. Um, (laughs) We were at some point. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, At first, they would only transport through spores Mm -hmm. and they grew in the back of their little leaves. Mm -hmm. And spores, all of these is the spores um, system, how it grows, how, you know, at first they were behind the leaves. They come out, they are blown by wind and fertilized, and Mm. then they grow a new plant. Wow. So all of these guys, which are the pine cones and the, yeah, cones, there's... The conifers. Fe- yes, yeah. the conifers, there's female and male cones, mm-hmm. and one of them have the egg, the others have the pollen, and when they mix together, they, they make pollination, and new plants come around. Mm. And then the first seeded plants come around, which are these guys here, which include the water lily and all of this in the turquoise um, orbit is the pollination process. Mm-hmm. Here's the little bee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Perfect. Is the that the only animal you incorporated in here? Yes. Mm. That's the only. Well, it's a powerful animal. Yep. Well, they've helped pollination throughout history. Mm-hmm. So after the turquoise um, orbit, we have a bunch of different plants and mm-hmm. most of them are my favorite plants yeah. or plants that I've been investigating for a little while. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's ginger. That's a funny ginger, but mm-hmm. there's ginger right here. Here you have San Pedro and you also have um, peyote. You have uh, lavender. There's the pitcher plants, cacao, mm-hmm. dandelion, hibiscus. Tulsi is somewhere around here. Here's mm. Tulsi. Here's coffee. Um, and pretty much for all the plants in the outer part, I tried. And while painting, this is something I do for most of my paintings. Mm-hmm. If I'm tapping into the energy of something, I physically try and tap into that energy. So let's say while I was painting hibiscus, mm. I was drinking hibiscus. Wow. So I try and do that for most of them. Just embodying that plant as much as possible. Exactly. I do have like a heavy, um, I have a spiritual practice, a daily spiritual practice. And I, I feel it's very important for my work. I feel if I'm centered, I don't want to put a lot about me in the paintings. Mm. I want to be a vessel Mm -hmm. that just transports energy, you know? Yeah. So I feel that drinking these plants while painting painting them is really making the spirit of the plant kind of mm. talk through me of course i wasn't drinking peyote yeah, or san pedro <laughs> while painting yeah um i've actually never uh visited their realms mm. but they are there because i respect them a lot mm. and i hope to um sit down in ceremony with them at some point when mm-hmm. the time is right Mm-hmm. Um, that's why they're in the outer part. But yeah, most of them I was drinking 
while painting, like, let's say, coffee, um, ginger, aloe vera, um, damiana. Damiana, that leads me into my next question, actually. Yes. Um, so I'm really interested in dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about it a lot on this podcast. And uh, for a while, I was experimenting with different plant medicines mm -hmm. that helped and enhanced your dream life. Mm -hmm. uh, one of these plants is Kalea Zakhtachichi. Uh -huh. Another one is Damiana yes. and Valerian root. Uh -huh. um, what is your experience with intentionally using plants to have an effect on your dream life? So I've never taken plants. I also know uh, Blue Lotus is Blue one Lotus. of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the plant that has been used by the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. The Egyptian Blue Water Lily. Yes. Also yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've never used them to either lucid dreams or have uh, more vivid dreams as a tea in that way. I've mm -hmm. been doing something a little bit different. And I don't know if this is uh, from any culture. I don't know if this is traditionally made by any um, ancestral tradition, but... This friend of mine uh, called Romina, she's mm -hmm. from Peru and she's living in New York right now. She works a lot with um, periods and mm -hmm. menstruation and how sometimes women just like hold back and feel a little shy about it and like stains and all that. And, you know, I, I was also telling you that recently I've been growing a lot of plants from seeds, mm -hmm. which is something new for me before I would just buy plants and take care of them. And Romina told me that um, her abuela, her grandmother, taught her that when you're in your period, your blood is full of iron. And if you dilute that with water, you can actually water your plants with your period. Hmm. And I started doing that and it's been very interesting because wow. it's, it's connected me more to my own blood, my own body. Um, and when I started watering my plants with my blood, I started dreaming. I started having dreaming dreams with them. So they were talking me in my dreams. Wow. Um, which was very interesting and loving. And that's why now I feel I'm so connected to the ones that I've grown from seeds. I've never tried, you know, Blue Lotus or Damiana mm -hmm. for lucid dreaming, but this has been my intake in g bringing plants into my dream life. Wow. And I actually feel it's time to start, um, trying some blue lotus or damiana mm -hmm. or different lucid dreaming plants mm -hmm. uh, i also feel that i don't work with all the plants at the same time i like let's say when i was making this painting i was drinking a lot of tulsi which is also called holy basil and mm. it's right here in the painting yeah um and that was the plant that i was working with at the time i really like to like concentrate and have a very broad experience with a plant for a long time. And uh, I feel like the Lucy Dream plants are something that I will start um, mm -hmm. incorporating this summer. It just feels they're, they're calling me somehow. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh -huh. Blue Lotus is a really interesting one. Yes. Um, so I've experimented with Blue Lotus before, and uh, the technique I used was to soak it in wine for two weeks. Wow. Apparently, that was the Egyptian practice. Uh -huh. uh, maybe there's something with the fermentation of the wine mm -hmm. that helps. Uh, extract the nutrients. It, it works very synergistically. And the feeling is like pure euphoria. You know, mm. it's like this, it, it's very similar to MDMA. I'm sure it can be used in a Whoa. very similar way. Yes. That was a, and, um, and it's, that's completely legal. There's yeah. a great company called Arena Ethnobotanicals, mm -hmm. um, that they have a bunch of these different plant medicines out there. Mm -hmm. Um, Something else I wanted to talk to you about is the metaphors of the plant world and what we can learn yes. and y about ourselves mm -hmm. by how plants kind of grow in nature. One of the metaphors that I love that I take from the plant wor world is to constantly grow towards the sun. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the physical sun. Of course, it's important to be out in the sun, but I think about it more archetypally as have a north star have an ultimate ideal mm -hmm. like this uh, an ultimate vision of light that you should constantly be 
pulling yourself towards growing towards the light. You know, Definitely. that's something that I take into my life that I've learned from the plant world. What are some other metaphors mm. that you've extracted from the plant kingdom? I really like how plants don't stop growing until they grow their first leaves. Mm. And their first, you know, that's the first thing that happens. Roots, stem, boom, two leaves at the same time. Because mm. from the leaves, the leaves make them able to get all the nutrients they need mm. um, and make photosynthesis. So I really like that it's like, okay, first thing that we need, get healthy. First thing that we need, be able to um, absorb as much nutrients as we need from the world. Mm -hmm. I really think about that a lot. And I also think a lot, I think it was Alan Watts who said, like, the sunflower is not thinking, the flower is just flowering. Mm -hmm. um, and the bird is just birding and the rain is just raining. And I always think about that uh, lecture by Watts because... Sometimes I get in my head a lot and let's say I'm walking the streets and I'm thinking I'm me walking the street. People mm -hmm. are looking at me walking the street. <laughs> and then it's like, why am I doing that instead of just being present mm -hmm. and being here and just not thinking about the vessel and just opening mm -hmm. up the eyes. So sure. that's something I think a lot about. Like, Plants oh, are in pure Zen. Exactly. Sunflower is just sunflowering and mm -hmm. Gato is just being Gato. Mm -hmm. You know, so I <laughs> I think a, about that a lot and also just having the ritual of taking care of them and watering them and taking the dead leaves out mm -hmm. and spending time with them really makes me be here now. Mm -hmm. And You know, some days you wake up and you're more fearful. And some days I wake up and I'm like, what am I even doing Think they, thinking that I can make a living out of paintings or mm -hmm. whatever? Hopefully that's like one day in 60. Um, but when I do, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to spend another minute fearing. I'm just going to go water my plants and be mm -hmm. with them. For sure. And they show up every day, you know. They they are not like, oh, today I'm fearful. I won't uh, blossom. They just do. So mm -hmm. how magnificent it is that they are they are just being Leela. They are just playing. So they always um, fascinate me and inspire me to keep blossoming. Yeah. Yeah. Something I, I've been bringing up Terrence McKenna a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, when talking about plants, it yes, just kind of he naturally of comes course. up. Uh, Something that is very interesting that he said was the process of growing mushrooms mm -hmm. and taking their uh, care of them and cultivating them properly mm -hmm. teaches you all the necessary prerequisites to having a successful uh, psychedelic experience with them. Right. You know, they teach you um, discipline, intention, mm -hmm. timing, taking notes. Um, and I think that's really fascinating that yeah. the plant just caretaking a plant can teach you a lot exactly yeah also seen i've only grown tomatoes <laughs> um talking about edibles mm -hmm. like veggies i and then every time i feed in a tomato from my tomato plant it's so sacred mm -hmm. but then when you buy it at the supermarket it's just like oh you know you might buy seven and then one of them might get bad And then you throw it. But then if yeah. you grow it, you won't really let it go bad. You'll really. Not. And that that's also like very um, grounding for me. Just realizing how much time it takes for mm -hmm. them to grow and for flowers to blossom mm -hmm. and for everything to work. Uh, I feel it also makes me be more grateful of every single piece of food that I have with me. Mm -hmm. And not let it go bad and just be like, oh, whatever, I'll just buy another one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So taking care of plants can change your relationship with plants. Mm -hmm. Drawing plants and representing plants in your art can also teach you a lot about plants. Now, yes. as the result of spending so much time studying plants and, and specifically making art with them, do you see plants differently? Is your eye trained to see certain details in a leaf that you just didn't see before? 
Yes, it's very interesting because I live pretty close to the Botanic Gardens, mm -hmm. uh, the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. And before I would go and get very mesmerized, but now going and being able to identify plants and identify which of them, uh, they do have a bunch of plants that are non-vascular and they have a bunch of plants that are uh, still in water. So it's mm -hmm. very good to even see the evolution process in them. And it's crazy, you know, uh, before studying them, I didn't realize that, you know, leaves have different patterns mm -hmm. and some of the veins grow parallel to each other. So they are just like linear. Yeah. So like this one here, it's just straight. Mm -hmm. And that, I don't remember the names, but there mm -hmm. are two types of flowering plants. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them grow, you can tell which of them it is by how the veins grow in the leaves. If mm -hmm. they grow like in a pattern going outside mm -hmm. that's one of the types and if they grow just linear it's the other type and also the amount of petals each flower has makes a difference in yeah. between if it's one or the other so it's so interesting and not only to the human eye uh, i've also seen a bunch of slides of stems under the microscope and they look very different depending of what type of plant it is mm -hmm. so if i would even do a broader study studying how plants look microscop microscopically, mm -hmm. I would even be able to know the difference just by observing the microscopic slide, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And yeah. that's actually the next step that I'm taking in my next art project yeah. is all of these little circles that I include in my mandalas will have microscopic uh, insights mm -hmm. for each plant that I'm painting. Yeah. So that's very exciting. That's why I too. love this piece so much. Like the first time I saw it, it has this kind of scientific element to it. It's almost like you are a biologist going mm -hmm. out and taking notes and like scientists, um, biologists will make like dot drawings of plants to to study the patterns and learn about the fine details mm -hmm. because that's how we extract the knowledge of how this plant uh has evolved to do things in the yeah. world you know and uh i love that your piece just really kind of has that scientific element to it well also before cameras were invented that's mm -hmm. how uh biologists kept their information they would always travel with an artist that would make sketches of the plants that they uh, they encounter. Actually, last year I even saw, or two years ago, in the new museum, they had footage of years ago. I don't remember what year it was, but they had this paper that you could submerge in water mm. and some special charcoal, so people would draw underwater to get information about corals. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's amazing. I know that's this, how important that information yes, is. It's not a job nowadays, but my dream job would mm. be going around the world painting all these plants. I think you could easily do that. Yes. Because your representations, like I love this mm -hmm. way more than I would love just a photograph mm -hmm. of these plants. Yeah. You know, I, I love that you're not only observing the plant, and representing it, but that you're filtering it through your imagination right. and adding your own yeah. artistic element to it. Yeah. A photograph of a uh, peyote cactus exactly. would not have a little eye in one of the flowers, <laughs> yes. you know? It's like you're, you're adding this essence yeah. that can't be captured in something like a photograph. I, when I'm painting, I feel, I think a lot about kids mm -hmm. learning biology in school. And I think a lot when I was a kid and I would see all the biology um, charts mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm not a chart person. I'm a visual person. And they, I didn't really felt very interest mm -hmm. on learning more because they really didn't look that pretty. Mm -hmm. um, so I when I'm doing this type of work, I think a lot like this is what a kid would really like to look and maybe this can help them stare five more minutes mm -hmm. into the outer world. So I mm -hmm. think a lot about that when I'm painting and I also, you know, I am I used to be very workaholic. I'm still a little because I just love everything that I learn from painting mm -hmm. and learning and painting plants 
I, what I'm trying to say is when I paint plants, I'm learning and I'm also doing my work. So I don't feel as guilty as just laying in the couch and watching documentaries for mm -hmm. eight hours. So that's something very beneficial. At some point, I really want to uh, go into the rabbit hole of the fungi kingdom. But that will be later. I feel there's a lot still that there's a lot that I still need to learn from the plants and that I mm. want to learn from them. But I will go into the fungi kingdom at some mm. point and also into the corals at some point. Mm. And wow. who knows where else, you know, yeah. um, but it takes time. Just like I really like to sit and have the same plant tea for mm -hmm. a month or so. I really like to sit down with one organism for a long time and like see all that I can mm. learn through it because there's so much. It's like infinite fractals of information yeah. in every kingdom. And I, I also think a lot that I don't know how long I'll be alive. Mm. Um, and I don't know how long I'll be alive in planet Earth. I mm. believe that there will be other lives later. But what if it's not in Earth? You know, what if it's like being a star elsewhere? What if it's in Mars or mm -hmm. a comet, whatever it is? <laughs> This is my chance to explore everything that nature has in our planet. And in this incarnation yes, right now, just exactly. absorb it all in. Yes. And maybe you're, so this is to get a little woo woo too, mm -hmm. but maybe your soul is encoding the experience mm -hmm. of each incarnation and every incarnation. It's a way of like, it's like a little university, you know, right. now you're studying the great teachers of earth, the exactly. plants. And yeah. maybe when you get uh, reincarnated as an amoeba on a comet flying <laughs> through the outer reaches of yes. the galaxy, the experience of that will somehow inform and condition uh, your soul as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I, um, I'm also very into math. I mm. love doing math problems mm -hmm. just because I feel that's the language of the universe. And I feel that might even be another uh, art piece at some point, just yeah. a lot of mathematical symbols. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank yeah. you so much for your work and helping all of us see the beauty in the plant kingdom that uh, we would otherwise overlook. You know, you're really good at at just putting the beauty of nature on a pedestal mm -hmm. and also imbuing your own just beautiful personality into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that everyone who appreciates your art um, just is very grateful for that. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's yeah. actually my pleasure to paint these guys. I feel um, they are giving me permission to speak mm -hmm. about them. And that's that's an honor for me. Um, I feel, you know, I would never be able to have a s or draw all the beauty they have, but I, I do what I can. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, it's so much fun. It's mm -hmm. teaching me a lot. So it's, it's great. Thank you for having me. For this sure. Been great. Do you have any final words for, um, any artists listening to this who, uh, any words on creative inspiration or, art or artistic expression? I feel the world has all the, things we need to get inspired sometimes when i'm blocked i just go to the botanical gardens i just go to the ocean i just take a walk and then get mesmerized by everything by mm. everything around us and you know every time that i say goodbye to anyone i say bye i wish i wish you plants i wish you outdoor i wish you sun and i wish you water there's like so much to learn from mm -hmm. from those special friends for sure yeah Well, Caro, thank you so much for lifting the iceberg with me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel. And where can people find more about you and lifting the iceberg? Yeah. So uh, you can go to liftingtheiceberg.com to find this episode and download it. It's also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook at Lifting the Iceberg. Uh, or on Instagram at Lifting the Iceberg, and you can find me at Tyler James Berger. Cool. And I'm yeah. going to add these all in the video's description. So thank you for watching, and have a great day. Bye, everybody. Bye.